so he was streaming RuneScape and he was like, I will give a hundred, I think it was $225 to anyone that could eat two onions raw <laughs> on the stream. You can't cook it. You can't cut it. You have to eat it like an apple. And I'm just like, uh, I'll do three. What is up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. Um, you know, it's been really cool to, as Scoped has grown over the years and we've covered more shows and festivals in the States, to just make so many friends uh, across the the States um, when it comes to, um, you know, doing what we do. And a band that I ran into really, really early on and have gotten to um, see a number of times, I think mainly because this band is based just south of the border. Um, so their access to Canada is a little bit more than a band from California or Florida or Texas. Um, so um, as far as the the bands that this person is a part of and, you know, just how, you know, we've gotten to connect over the years, it was, you know, and I was thinking of, of guests from Detroit so specifically. I wanted to have my buddy Joe on. So without further ado... The vocalist of the only band in hardcore that I know, or is supposedly <laughs> sponsored by Manscaped, um, Joe from Big Deal, <laughs> Enemy of God, and Hushed. Dude, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. I love the I love the little intro there. <laughs> of course, you got you got to plug your shit. What's what's the code for the for the? <laughs> uh, <laughs> big deal. That's that's all it is. Big deal. Yeah. Um, so, so Joe, yeah, like we initially met, uh, I'm sure you remember, uh, very, very, uh, many moons ago at, uh, Snow and Flurry 2019. It was our first time actually filming an American Fest, uh, in general. And, okay. you know, getting, getting to see you play with Enemy of God was like, you know, I remember it was either then or when I caught you guys just a few months later when I did like just a one off fly in to film a toronto show that enemy of god was also playing i think you were telling me about like i like playing in this band but i like i want to be doing something a little bit more <clears throat> core related versus something that's just like more in that metallic or metalcore space and then yeah. when you dropped big deal i was like whoa this shit is <laughs> fucking fantastic and uh thank you, you thank just you. seeing the success of that band over the last you know few years has been really cool so i'm really stoked to chat with you today but before we get into the music chats, as you know, got to check some bevs. So what do you got for the ep today? Yeah, I got a Black Rifle Espresso Mocha, which just coming to think of it now, I don't know if it's present in Canada. I think it might be no. an American thing. But it's got a it's, cool Well, Black cool Rifle camo is camo. a very American <laughs> branding, <laughs> for sure. But yeah, it's like a, it's like a super espresso uh little drink there so mm -hmm. so is black rifle like a coffee company or do they just do um guns and bevs I, I'm, I'm just <laughs> trying to learn no it's 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 just a bleeding but yeah they make good coffee man they make good coffee okay dope I, I i've always like there's only a few coffee companies um that i fuck with that do like the canned coffee because sometimes i feel like it's a little bit hit or miss so for i know it's that's the first time that's being checked on the show for sure um but you've intrigued yeah. me and i definitely want a espresso mocha gun flavored bev um, <laughs> to hit my gullet hopefully this year we'll we'll see hey ne next time you're in the states you got one on me man <laughs> okay. What's what's the is it is it pretty like common at like uh different convenience stores or is it like yeah. kind of more specialty? It's been popping up a lot more. Like when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, this looks kind of cool. I'll try it." And then <laughs> after that, I see everyone. People wear like black rifle shirts now and stuff like that. So <laughs> they they they're making a name for themselves. 
one. It's good. Okay. Coffee. Very, very <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm drinking just a very classic uh, sparkling water, like liquid death. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have any uh, canned uh, coffee on me, unfortunately. So I can't match you, but at least the cans are similar in, uh, in design at the very yeah. least. Oh, I mean, the, the liquid death can is unbeatable. I mean, that's, oh, that's yes. the greatest Goated, thing about for it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, Joe. Well, um, you know, not to make it a big deal, but I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. <laughs> there we go. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Um, so, Joe, any guests who it's their first time on the show, I always like to get a little bit of context about how they just got onto their uh, onto this whole thing we call hardcore, um, you know, your hardcore origin story to to a degree. So talk to yeah. me like when the when you were first hearing about heavy music, whether that was like straightforward punk or if there was, you know, something that was a little bit more off the beaten path where you found your way eventually. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so it was all kind of through my brother. Um I was maybe 11 or 12 years old and I listened to things like, you know, some 41 and went, uh, Lincoln park and all that stuff. But, um, he actually showed me a band called Dr. Acula and this was the old okay. Dr. Acula days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. through that, I just kind of explored and, um, I was 12 going to shows in Romeo, Michigan, which is like a very small town, which is kind of weird. They had a venue there at the time, but it was a, badass venue it was really cool um mm -hmm. and i saw a lot of like grindcore stuff like the super heavy sludge metal all that stuff and then through that i kind of just found hardcore and um when i was 14 i joined my first band argus and through that i kind of met tristan and other people and joined short leash and then it kind of just a snowball effect from there you know Sure. So, and then so I, I kind of found out I liked the more of the hardcore punk side than, you know, the super right. heavy stuff yeah. I was initially. Yeah. And was that heavy stuff initially? Because, you know, there are people that have a very similar path where they're listening to that, like, really heavy stuff that they're discovering through, like, um, YouTube or, or, or for fans of. Um, was when it was like straight up like oh this is hardcore whether you knew it or not like did you immediately jump into it because some people have like a hesitancy they're like where's the crazy production where are the fucking pig squeals or whatever it is until they uh so i'm just kind of curious on where you fell on that um on that spectrum um i kind of i guess i was a little hesitant at first like hearing like the rawness of it i'm like you know this isn't it's a little bit out of my realm of what I'm used to. Um, and then it kind sure. of grew on me over time. So just like anything, there was kind of like a, a kind of gradual process. I had a little bit of a scene phase. I'll, I'll admit, you know, I, <laughs> I liked my asking Alexandria at one point, but uh, yeah. And something that kind of comes to mind is um, I remember hearing, I will be heard by hate breed. And that was like a, a big turning point for me. Cause I really liked, you know, just uh it, it wasn't really raw production, but you could tell like it was his raw voice and it was kind of true right. to the sound more so than guttural screams and all that stuff. So, right. Yeah. There's definitely like certain bands that are, are just on that, like kind of on that, um, that not on the fence specifically, but they can, ju they can play in both lanes when it comes to like more metal adjacent stuff as well as like just this is just a hardcore band at the end of the day and hate breed is right. definitely one of those examples that i think m made it make sense for people and i think there's different generational bands of that like a big band for me once it was actually like learning and and appreciating that like more raw, raw style of like heavy music was trapped under ice because it was oh, like yeah, cool. like just the the vocals alone it was like pulling me in based off like oh like these don't have like the fucking like jump in place fucking breakdowns but like it's it's so like hard. it's so catchy and so good so and so hard yes exactly yeah that was an earlier band for me too that kind of drug me in you know when i heard true love and please to meet me uh please to meet you the first time it was right. just yeah yeah so um are you uh so all the bands that you're uh, playing in are based in Detroit. Is that where you grew up? 
Uh, no, I've actually always grown up. Uh, I've always lived maybe an hour north. So I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere uh, between Detroit and Flint. Um, okay. My neighbor, my neighbors were horses and donkeys. And, you know, <laughs> uh, right now I'm living in Clarkston, uh, which is a little bit more of a populated area, but um, still kind of out there about 45 yeah. minutes from Detroit. So I have long, long drives to band practice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, a few less horses and donkeys and a little bit more humans and <laughs> and, uh, and and people. Um, so was was that I guess experience where you're living a little bit more uh, rural and just out um, from like the main city areas? Did that um, was that a challenge when you were kind of getting into music and and starting to play in bands, or did that kind of put a fire under your butt to like I really want to do this and I'll find a find a way. Right. Uh, I guess a little bit of both because I, I think growing up at a younger age, trying to get into hardcore when I don't have a license and all that stuff, um, it limited me because the only venue I really had that I could go to was the Static Age, which was the venue I mentioned earlier. It's actually a really badass venue. They had Trapped Under Ice, a bunch of bands play there in the middle of nowhere. Um, but like... Everyone talks about Modern Exchange, which was a big Detroit venue, and I didn't really ever get to experience that. But um, definitely living up there, I I never had a problem. When I started meeting people from Detroit, I never really had a problem making it to things. I always found a way, you know, mm-hmm. whether it was finding a ride or yeah, what what have you. It was always always doable in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, it is definitely a. Uh not a reality check but like when you remember when um you know especially with this new wave of kids that are coming into the scene which is really cool to see you remember it's like oh some of these kids don't even have their license and they don't have you know parents who are like down to drive them to the show potentially so it's like either seeing them figure it out and do that or you know if there's an opportunity where it's like well this kid like lives on the way to the show like i'll just pick them up like I think like those those things like have a lasting impact on on people because you know I've I've heard it from so many people who have come on the show who are like if it wasn't for this person driving me to like the local show that maybe 40 people were playing like I wouldn't have started this band or this label or, right. or started this thing so yeah it's uh it definitely is a reality check when you're you know 25 or or 30 plus in in my books where you're like oh right yeah like you know, things are accessible, but you know, there, there are certain things that, that go into, um, putting on a good show, especially in a, in a, you know, a not city center kind of base as well. Yeah. And relating to that, uh, I got to shout out Richie Majewski. He's the new, uh, guitarist to hush. He plays the second guitar and, yeah. um, he's always been super big into it. And I had to pick him up for one of our shows cause he's kind of nearby me. So I'm like, I'll pick you up. And he's like, okay, cool. Uh, do you mind coming in real quick and meeting my mom first? She just wants to make sure that I'm, you know, uh, going like, you know, I'm not going with a complete stranger. Can you come meet my mom? And I thought that was the coolest thing. I'm just like, wow, you are, you are young, but that's, that's yeah. awesome. I, <laughs> right. And there's, there's a lot of kids like that in Detroit that are that age and just kind of loving it. And it kind of brings me back a little bit you know, to when I first discovered hardcore and how exciting it was for me. Not that it's not exciting now, but, you know, just yeah. kind of experiencing it all for the first time is just like, it was awesome. So it's kind of cool oh, to dude. see so many kids kind of having that same experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I, 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 I always say it where, like, you know, a, a show on a Friday could just be another show because, like, when you're this deep into it, it just is second nature to like, oh yeah, of course I'm going to go to show. It's like, I don't even care who's playing. I'm just like, that's what I do. That's what I've been doing for five, 10, 15 years, whatever it is. But like, there could be someone where it's like, that's their very first hardcore show ever. That's the first time that they're going to like break out of their shell and like start two-stepping or try to do that. Um, Or, you know, the first time that they grab the mic. So I don't know, to me, it's like, I'm always trying to think about how do I foster like a good environment to, to have those things because those first experiences are like, 
very memorable. I still remember the first time a band that I was playing in played like a fest and people were, you know, not from where we were from coming to grab the mic and circle pitting and moshing. And that shit was like mind blowing to me at the time. Yeah. That's a beautiful moment when, you know, you kind of realize that you've reached outside of your own community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, But yeah, shout out to all the, uh, the parents who were like, yeah, go check out the show. Um, and maybe I just want to meet Joe and just make sure he's not a dickhead or (laughs) anything. like that. Yeah, exactly. It was, uh, it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. So, um, now he's, now he's ripping for Hosh. Now he's ripping for Hosh and he's at every show. (laughs) Yes. We love that. We love to see it. So, um, talk, so we've talked a little bit about like going to shows. Um, were you always like a musical kid and picked up the guitar right away or did that kind of come as you were discovering hardcore? Kind of as I was discovering hardcore. Um, I think the first time I picked up a guitar was when I was 13 and, you know, playing some 41 playing blink 182 songs and then kind of gradually got into it. I was always, I was always a basketball kid. That was my life up until hardcore. And then I kind of just, made the transition you know and i could only do wow. so much i would yeah. have never expected that because you're, <laughs> you're kind of a short king so um you know, oh, not yeah. to say that short kings can't play basketball but it's just <laughs> not the uh the expectation there people just assume if you're six foot fill in the blank that you should play the NBA. Yeah. yeah no i uh i still am a big basketball head i was at the pistons game last night and you know always something I've carried with me, but that was my main focus when I was earlier on was just basketball. And then I found a love for hardcore and kind of overrode that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was like, did you find that you had to make a choice as far as like how much you were, you know, shooting hoops versus playing riffs or was it just all consuming when it came to like discovering the hate breeds and then going down the rabbit hole and you're like, it was all like you weren't even think about how how little time you were playing or or investing in in basketball. Is, is that right? Yeah. So it kind of was like a clean cut. You know, it was just like, do I join the team or do I have band practice two days a week at five when I would usually have basketball practice or a game? Right. Right. So I was just like, I you know, I was super big into guitar at the time, and I was like, ah, that's that's the choice I got to make. You know. Mm-hmm. which I'm obviously glad I made it because I don't think I would have joined the NBA. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but, I do appreciate you saying that, though, because I, I've talked about this with uh, with colleagues and friends. It's like it's so important to like the kids who are like in their actual teenage years who are going to shows and doing this stuff. Like if they don't have, you know, uh, if they don't have access to going to shows or like, you know, like especially when things aren't all ages, like that's what really pisses me off because we live in a world now where it's like social media is at like an all time, like high when it comes to just like people discovering all these different things. So if they discover hardcore, but they can't go to hardcore shows for another three years, like they're going to find something else to do. And that's going to become their identity and their like early stages. Right. Um, so yeah, like I appreciate you saying that because it's like, yeah, like they're, there could be there's a subtle timeline where it's like you and i never meet maybe some of the bands that you're a part of like never existed because you you know went the basketball route and uh maybe on the nba i don't know (laughs) (laughs) maybe maybe yeah Yeah. uh butterfly effect right it's like i go down this road and i meet these people and you know kind of it all snowballs into whatever your life may be. And it, it all happens for a reason. You know, I truly believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess like going back to the original question, you kind of picked up the guitar after kind of like getting involved in, in hardcore. So, um, yep. you know, and you met a couple of the people that you're playing with nowadays very early on. So you've been jamming with them for a minute. Um, yep. We're going to kind of skip over enemy of god not to you know because that uh, again was like the the first band that i knew you from but there's other members of that band that i think i would want to have on the podcast to just talk solely about that so when did the ideal of like 
big deal come into play? Was it something brewing for you like for a long ass time in the midst of playing guitar? Um, or like, did the idea of fronting a band come in a, in a, a in a unique way? Well, so first came short leash actually. And that's, mm-hmm. was my, my baby for a while. That's the, you know, the touring band that I was in and all that stuff. And then took a break from that. And I started writing stuff on my own, which are songs, watch you die, cold blood. Um, I actually recorded all by myself and then, um, sat on that for maybe a year and a half, two years. So it was definitely in the works for a while. And then I've always wanted to start a band with our drummer, Jake, and then my older brother, you know, we were in bands before and, you know, it's just, he's a ripper. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. always wanted to have him on board and then Tristan, who I've kind of known forever. So, um, it was definitely in the works and I kind of had some of the material written prior to big deal starting. Um, and then just kind of added some members. We have Wade on guitar now too. He kind of is pretty big thrash head. So he adds a good, good mix to it. So uh, yeah, just kind of grew from there after I recorded the stuff on my own. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, um sonically i think the first you know couple tracks when when you dropped it uh i was like oh okay like this is kind of like a fun jammy kind of hardcore band but the more that i've listened to it and especially just prepping for this podcast like the thrash element is so like is is almost like the secret ingredient to your guys's like vibe (laughs) you know like it's not like overly thrash like a band like um fucking enforced or living in fear or any of that it's like just so subtly like put in there um and you know to hear uh i i was reading uh like you did a zine interview where you're talking about like big deal is kind of just like a formation and a um kind of a, a cauldron of like all these different influences that we all have yeah yeah no i, I think that's what's so cool about it we are completely different people but it kind of comes to like you said just a subtle thrash um hardcore mix i've i'm always i'm pretty versatile i like crossover a lot i like metal i like hardcore um our drummer is a little bit more on the heavy side and then our guitarist jimmy my brother he's a little bit more rock influenced, like rock and roll right. or like Led zeppelin van halen what have you you know all that stuff so um I think it kind of came together nicely. Um, and yeah, that's just kind of the final product. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know. I'm, I like having the diversity in the hardcore space of having bands that are like kind of like one dimensional or two dimensional to a degree where it's like, we're only doing this, but we do it so, so well. But I feel like a band like you guys that can kind of play in, in multiple lanes, like it allows you guys to play on, you know, for, for you guys to play on multiple shows without it feeling like a mixed bill show, if that makes sense. It's like, Oh yeah, we can do like a fucking, you know, if dead heat is coming to town, you know, uh that makes sense for us to play but you know if it's end it or scowl like it doesn't feel like oh now we got the now we feel like we have to throw a death metal band to make it fully uh you know a fucking mixed right. thing but um yeah it's cool i'm like you know i don't just say this because you're on the podcast like but i really fuck with the riffs on on uh oh, thanks on so the much. music that you guys have put out thank you very much yeah that's just kind of for fun you know that's the one thing when i started the band i'm like you know i had my serious route you know trying to put out music and get as much exposure as possible but we're just going to go out there and have as much fun as we can if that brings us out of state that brings us out of state but the number one priority is just finding love in what we do and not trying to to overdo it for ourselves if that makes sense yeah did you so short leash is the band that you're referring to that you like were really trying to give it gas and trying to like send it out right yeah yep that was the band that toured the most hush did a a few things here and there but short leash i mean it seemed like it was every other month for two weeks at a time you know which was fine i love it i wouldn't i wouldn't give those times back for anything but you know 
you kind of add the whole business side. It kind of takes up the love for it a little bit, you know, it can, or it can't, you know, and, uh, you know, coming back into it with kind of a different mindset, I think is what I needed. Mm -hmm. So, and it kind of restored my love for hardcore and everything that is. Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, and, and the, the serendipity of like maybe certain things working at, or not working at the time and maybe working now, like, do you feel like with a new mindset that you took into big deal and some of the, the newer stuff that you're doing, it actually yields a better or more fulfilling reward for you when it comes to just like how, you know, cause I think that you guys like, you know, regionally, I see you guys like doing some really, really cool stuff. Like you played tie down last year um, and a couple other things, but like, do you feel like when you're looking at both of those like side by side, do you feel better about, uh, I guess, like the stuff with this new mindset where it's like lower my expectations, but that might um, give me a, a, a greater uh, sense of, you know, it, it's just more cool because I wasn't expecting it versus like I'm really trying to push for it with this this other band. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think just the, I mean, everyone from Short Leash has done, I could honestly say we've done better things in different bands since then. Tristan has Normal, which is like, they just released an LP that's insane. It's just kind of softer grunt stuff. And then Chris and Robert joined Doubt It, which is bigger than any band we've ever <laughs> had, you know? Right. And then we joined Big Deal, which is, is much more of a joy for me. Um, like I said, kind of coming from that different mindset and um, I think it all worked out as good as it could have possibly worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the reason I ask is because, you know, I think the older that you get, you know, some people get in, in their head that it's like, oh, I, these are my glory years to try to make something happen. And, you know, as, as a, you know, someone who just turned 30, the bands that I'm doing now where my expectations at the beginning were like, very low like i just wanted to kind of play local shows because i was busy with doing scope stuff um but now that has like scaled up where it's like oh shit like we could do an entire canadian tour yeah. or go down and do the states because people are asking for that and i feel like if i had expected it it wouldn't seem as as cool as as the situation that i'm in now so it sounds like that's a similar um yeah thing for you well my number one thing too is with touring we go to texas i think we went texas like three summers in a row and we were like grasping at straws trying to play mississippi so we didn't have an 18 hour drive you know right. or you know um i think with big deal we're not really trying to we're not trying to play places that we don't already have opportunities for if that makes sense right. like we're not trying to just fill in the gaps we're just trying to make do with what opportunities we're presented with yeah so, I think I think that and like you said, when your ex- expectations aren't going on a, a two week tour, it when you do kind of get a good outcome on a show or whatever it be, it's it's definitely a little bit more rewarding and a little bit more. Um, what's the word for it? a little bit more authentic, you know? Right. And I, and I do see now like there are people in more underdog kind of scenes that are like really riding to bring the bands that they really like to their, to their scenes. And that could be a one-off show for a fest or, or for a tour. Um, but I think about when, when Brian from knocked loose was on, like he was talking the early days of knocked wasn't to, um, you know, Oh, let's just tour as much as we can so we can become the biggest band ever. It was like, let's tour to these like unconventional places. So, every show no matter where we play it can be fun versus like oh we're playing this state you know we haven't played here in five fucking years it's gonna be a fucking you know it's you know it's gonna be more band practice than like we're playing a show if you know what i mean Um, yeah but uh i think that's very cool to kind of see a shift now where where people aren't just doing the um like oh, we're just going to skip and only do like the coast and we're going to, you know, skip over the flyover states because if anything, like I'm seeing more dope bands and scenes and people who are trying to put those on the map who are from like the Milwaukee's, the Oklahoma's, the right. uh, the Missouri's. So that's very cool to see for me personally. 
Uh, and I think Absolutely. why is because like, you know, I think where we're both from, we're both from like under underdog scenes that don't have the, the, the history and the lore and all those like things that uh, a California or a New York would are just like right. a part of their culture. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, especially, you know, I think COVID kind of made people realize that, you know, it took it for granted a little bit. And ever since, you know, it's been, at least in Detroit, it's been insane every show, like even mm -hmm. since, you know, and it's just good to see, you know, I, um, a lot of new new faces every single show right and yeah, like you said I've i seen... think a lot of i think a lot of those smaller scenes are definitely trying to put on for their scene a little bit more and you know give the support that is needed for fans you know absolutely um yeah and i think like detroit is interesting because you know very intentional for me to wear my never ending game shirt but like that was the band that i feel like you know for even just like uh, someone who doesn't really get nerdy about like discovering new bands as much. Again, this is all kind of like pre COVID. Cause I think COVID like being in lockdown kind of like forced people to like practice, like discovering new music a little bit more. Um, but like never ending game was like the only band that maybe someone could list from, from Detroit, but you know, seeing, you know, the, the show coverage that like Sonny has been doing, um, when he's at like, um, the printing shop and like tied down fest and all those things. It's like really cool to see like, you know, bands like big deal or D block, um, kind of getting a little bit more love that way. Um, yeah. Did you feel like it was, it took kind of that pandemic stuff or when did you see the shift of like, Oh, there's, there's more bands than just NEG who, who are from here on, on a, like, um, an international basis. Cause obviously you go to the local show and everyone, everyone knows what's up. Right. Yeah. No, I think the shift, a lot of it did have to do with not having shows for almost a year and then it coming back. And I got a shout out NEG because they are a big part of, you know, kind of what brought a lot of these bands on the map. Like the first big deal show was the comeback show after the pandemic with never any game and end it. And, mm -hmm. you know, that brings out Sonny from 856 and, you know, it kind of gives a light on different bands, you know, that usually wouldn't get filmed by 856 otherwise, you know. Right. And um, I remember like Enemy of God played with like Gridiron and, you know, that was like a big turning point too. Like that's, everyone still talks about that Gridiron release show with Pain of Truth, you know. Um, so I think a lot of it is thanks to the bands that kind of already did have that exposure and kind of giving the scene a shot. I mean, we played, a, they call it a 10 for 10 show on the new year's day, uh, 10 local bands for $10 and oh, going okay. into it, going into it. I'm like, this could be cool. It might not. It sold out. It was probably one of the craziest shows I've ever seen. And that was just wow. like such a cool, cool moment, you know? I'm just like, wow, it's not really just about the bigger bands anymore. It's about everyone, the whole scene. So Yeah. I yeah, that's been, you know, I, I think the idea um of like selling out a show is, you know, I think a lot of people will look at that as like a a success metric or like a clout metric. But I think it's like the fact like that's not based off the bands who are playing, it's more about the scene. So, you know, the I have a new band that we played our first show uh, just a couple weeks ago. And before the, the first band of that show even played, like the sh show sold out. It, it was like over capacity as far as like the venue that we were at. And like to me, that just goes to show that there are people that um, that are down for the shit. And if anything, people on the outside, it's like you're seeing a show poster. You're like, oh, maybe I'll go attend that. And then it's like, oh, this shit's sold out. Like you almost feel like damn i i you know it wasn't like i missed out because you know it looked like a fun time it's like oh, i really missed out because it like sold out that way yeah yeah no it's been it's been great for uh, every scene really lately i've i've definitely seen like other videos and footage from chicago chicago had a crazy show the other night and like it's just it seems like everyone's kind of thriving a little bit right now mm-hmm 
Yeah. And I do, I do agree that like, you know, just a couple of days ago, I saw that, um, you know, friends of mine that run a DIY spot out in Boise, um, you know, it's, uh, the ingrown and tsunami. it's, it's the, it, it's the Boise date of tsunamis, like, uh, American tour that do, they're doing in a couple months and they're bringing out sunny to film that. And I think that's going to be super big, like, not like it's really impartial like it doesn't really matter for for tsunami or ingrown specifically because those bands those bands have been filmed a million times let alone just by right. sunny but like it's huge for the actual scene because then it's for like idaho yes yeah and like there's already been a shift with like ingrown as a as a band really like putting on and like trying to showcase that so i think i think it's that example just as you said it's like that band that has pushed a little bit more past their region or their, even their country. And they're getting to, you know, shout out the bands, take the bands that are of their neck of the woods on tour. And that's how you kind of grow, not only like help out your friends that are, you know, moshing and supporting you um, at the shows regardless, but also like your scene in general. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, that's where Sonny is doing beautiful things for hardcore, you know, in every state, because like I've heard a lot of bands come through Edgeman, like the screen printing shop where they have shows at. And they're like, I saw the drain footage here from eight, five, six. And I, I had to book a show here. You know, I had to, right. this is like yeah. a, a must, a must stop for me. So I think like even just the environment of what he films people it just grabs people you know dude that it's huge it's like i want to play philadelphia not to play this as hardcore fest but to play the church so i can be on the fucking foamy floor you know and i want to play <laughs> right. orange county so i could play program and i want to play fucking um tacoma for like the real art you know like it, it yeah. just the list goes on and on and on and i and i totally agree that like seeing especially unconventional spaces versus like, Oh, this venue looks cool. Unconventional spaces attract like people to like, Oh, I want to play there. Like Endgame played, yeah. um, an indoor skate park in Hamilton. And like the, when the footage dropped, it was like, people were just being like, where is that? Like, I want to play that. And like, it's in Ontario. So like, you know, go play Toronto, but like also add a Hamilton date because that, that spot's really, really dope. And the people that run it are awesome. Yeah. I don't. So big deal actually has a show next weekend in Hamilton. It's our first oh. time going to Canada. Um, I don't think it's at the skate park. I think it might be a, it's wherever D block played a few months ago. Um, yeah. I don't exactly know what I'm getting into, but it sold out like, it sold 50% of tickets in the first day. So it's like, I've heard, I'm so, so excited for that to bring big deal yeah. to Canada and enemy of God's playing it too. Um, which we've played Canada a handful of times, but we've never played Hamilton. So, mm -hmm. and it's like cold shoulder and spirit of vengeance. So it's like, that's a, I'm, that's a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a big homie hangout, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's funny cause spirit of vengeance is a, you know, uh, Blaine's been on the show who plays bass in that band. And it's like, yeah. it's crazy to see how just chaotic their shows have been. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really excited for you based off that, you know, depending on when this podcast drops, that could be, you know, it already happened, but, um, you should have a great time regardless. I think any of the towns and cities south of Toronto are just really on something right now. So it'll be a good time for yeah. sure. And even D Block came back to the States and they're just like, Hamilton was off the rails, like just crazy. So, dude, dude. And again, that's all it takes is that like a band taking a shot and touring somewhere and the show going well people pitting fucking hard and like showcasing their style and their scene like that word travels fast and so like yeah i say that also for like the the people where it's like if you're if the if you're not giving a good experience for someone going to a show and that will have a trickle down effect for sure 
you bet your ass that it'll have a trickle down effect for the touring band who's going back to their city and being like, uh, maybe don't go over, over this way or don't work with this promoter or like, you know, it, like, you know, word of mouth is like such an undeniable thing. Um, and it's not something as like a marketing, like marketing is in my background. It's like, it's not something that you can really measure, but like, it is right. something that clearly works for, for hardcore, for anything in life. Yeah. No. And I mean, that's what hardcore has always thrived off of, you know, it's not really like a mainstream thing where you could see on a billboard that, you know, <laughs> never ending game is playing, you don't drive down the highway and see a hardcore show, you know, it's all, mm -hmm. it's all word of mouth. And like you said, it's, it's, first impressions and are a huge thing you know mm -hmm. um when it comes to detroit specifically like um is edgman like the you know because it's a screen printing place it's like i'm sure that the dudes are like down to throw shows all the time but they don't want it to be like oh we only do hardcore shows here like we have a whole business and you know assets and all these other things so yeah. is there like other spots or other places that um that you either want to plug or, or shout out as far as like you know when you're coming through here like um this is also a great spot to play yeah so i mean there's always the sanctuary in hamtramck which is a little north of detroit um they're they've been pretty much a show every day there they've been doing some wild things outside of hardcore they have, actually have like wrestling matches and stuff there now Oh shit! Um, which is <laughs> in, insane because it's a, it's just a smaller bar you know but they mm. they do wrestling events so definitely want to shout out the sanctuary because they've always been there as far as like hardcore shows it's really just been the sanctuary and edgeman i know in mm. berkeley michigan which is isn't too far either they've been having shows at like a a video game store too and i i haven't actually been able to check that out but i'm I'm definitely intrigued. I'd like to go one day and um, see you, what it's all you about. You have my attention as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'd say those three spots, I, I'm blanking on the name of the video uh, game mm. store. But, yeah, it's in Berkeley. They've had, uh, they've had a few shows there recently. I know it's a very, very new spot. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump back to, uh, to Big Deal. So um, as far as the time we're recording this, you guys have put out uh, kind of like a, a first release, an EP, um, and then just a single um, since then. Um, a question I had on the single is, is the song called Raw Deal or Beyond Repair? Because I saw that there's like two versions of the same um like artwork with different names so i was like what's oh yeah what's the story behind that so the the song is called raw deal and mm -hmm. the release we're about to come out with um is called beyond repair ah um, so we just had a thing gotcha. we had some single artwork that was like just a different colorway and we wanted to just put raw deal so mm -hmm. that's just okay. a little single coming out um and then we're going to have another single pretty soon here. And then we're going to come out with a full release. Okay. Do you want to drop the day of when that new single is, is, uh, is coming out? Uh, I'm not exactly sure yet. It should be within the okay. next two months. I'd hope so. So okay. uh, we're just gotcha. kind of polishing some things up in the studio for our, the other six songs. And then we'll release that once we finally have everything polished up. So, right. And is that um, coming out on a label? Um, yeah. I think I saw something that you guys signed to a, a New York-based label recently. Yeah, Heroes and Martyrs Records. So they actually mm -hmm. also signed um, Moral Pollution, which is a newer Detroit band. So it's us and Moral Pollution on the label. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, Steve from the label, he's great. He's been pushing for us and always messaging me, asking me what's up, you know, so... <laughs> He's he's definitely very helpful, and it's kind of cool. I'm honored to be able to release something through him. He's done a lot of stuff for a lot of bands. I know he did like No Warnings last release. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, Heroes of Martyrs is a newer label, but I know he has like a background in releasing things. You know, got you. Um, is is that going to have a physical release, or are you guys kind of you know still in the, in the mix of? when the whenever the fuck that we can do uh <laughs> physicals is is a is a fool's game right now yeah so we're definitely going to do like cds 
just to have something physical. And then we're going to do a, a record of some sort, probably seven inch of um, an A side being the great deal of pain, our first release. And then the B side being uh, beyond repair, the new release. So. Cool. Cool. I, I have been liking to see when bands do that because, you know, especially when it's like, I don't know if it's EP season right now, but it's like, that's the thing that a lot of bands have been doing. So it's like being able to buy one record that has both on there. That's um uh, that's a great move for sure. Yeah. And I'm a full supporter of just EPs. You know, I think, I think if you have <laughs> enough material, I think if you have enough material for a full length then absolutely go for it. But um, I think just releasing a few EPs, especially in the hardcore realm, just all killer, no filler. That's just the way to go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember who it was recently, but like, I believe, and, and I want to do this for myself as well, is like writing a full record is a, a way taller task than writing just four to five oh, yeah. or six good hardcore songs. It's like you, there's so many more things to consider, but I feel like that's a challenge that anyone who's like av an avid uh, musician within hardcore or any music genre should try to do. Um, but at the same time, like I've, I've been, you know, told by, uh, other people where it's like, you could put out a, a meh EP, but if you put out a meh record, it could like almost kill your band because it's like, oh, you're going to like, this is like the big thing that you're being like, this is our, you know, full record. But on the opposite side, like there, you, we've seen so many bands just explode because of that first solid borderline perfect record that they put out so um I, I i do like ep season uh especially for smaller bands but um i also encourage if you're wanting to do a full record and can like don't shy away from that either yeah no definitely i think i think that if like i said if you got the material and can write a solid 10 12 song then absolutely it's just mm -hmm. I think I think the attention span of a lot of people is not great, you know. Like I like the, <laughs> I, I like the super one LP that comes to mind is the Restraining Order LP. Like that's one of my favorite LPs. It's just super easy listening, you know, from front to back. Just I could listen to that LP like three times in a day and not feel like I spent the entire day listening through it, you know. Right. Yeah, I think especially for just like straight up hardcore, like you need to almost like if it's a if it's any other bands outside of that, it's like, yeah, if you're going to make 45 minutes worth of music, like go for it. But you could still write a killer LP that's the length of an EP for a band that's just <laughs> more like in an adjacent space, if you know what I mean. Just like keep that All shit right. like tight and uh, and don't don't have don't just like like oh this is a good enough song like you know spend the time if if you have it to to do a great ass record yeah no absolutely and that's why i wanted to shy away from not trying to fit songs uh like i'd rather pick a select few songs than try to add songs to make an lp you know if we have a pool of 15 songs we want to narrow it down to 10 or 12 that's what i you know want for an lp i wouldn't want to write songs just to finish it if that makes sense mm -hmm. um off the top of your head three lps of detroit bands that are goaded and then three eps that are goaded from all detroit oh, bands God. if you can do that putting you on the spot a little bit here um born to land hard by Cold as Life. That's the first one that comes to mind as far as an sure. LP goes. Um, God, this really is on the spot. Um, well, how about I'll, I'll I'll knock one off each. So just two, two per 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 category. The Tyrant LP that's goaded. X Tyrant okay. X. That's a a big influence for me. Um, I, I, I want to do three. I want to do three. I could think of it. Okay. Other. Okay. Uh, I got a shout out. Uh, no, it's, a, it's hardcore Jason just cause they're all hardcore dudes, but, uh, lemonized by normal, uh, just incredible. Like that, 
blew my mind when it came out and I first heard it. I was like, wow, hmm. that's, that's a, a masterpiece. That's, that's yeah. an LP that there's, there's no filler. That's a properly done LP. So I'm very, okay. very I might have to check that. that out. I think naming your band normal is like almost like name your band no name. It's so like <laughs> basic, but like like if you're making something that's like the opposite of normal, like that's that's very interesting to me. So I'm gonna definitely check that out after we do this. Yeah, yeah. No, I would highly recommend it. And then uh the EPs, I'd have to say uh Halo and Wings. Never any game. Of course. Um, yes. Um D Block, the Destroy, Intimidate, Eliminate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another big one. The crowd reactions I've seen for every song on that album are just insane. And then uh I'm gonna go with Demon Dance by Doubt It. That's that's okay. A, kind of a groundbreaking run. Just seeing the way that the the shift and seeing how many people get into that and how it kind of routing back to what we were talking about before kind of put it on the map i would say demon mm -hmm. dance by doubt it has been huge the amount of kids that know those lyrics is just mind-boggling to me <laughs> yeah no those are all great picks and i encourage everyone you know obviously there's like the vast majority of people are like oh, of course like the never ending game halo wings but go check out those other releases like that um there's some good shit there for sure um Speaking of Detroit, I always like to, you know, I can't even remember the last time I had someone from Detroit specifically on the podcast. You might be one of the first, um, but oh, I like to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> I always like to, like, ask if there's any, like, misconceptions about a scene that, you know, someone, you know, having the opportunity on a podcast to, to kind of break. Um, is there anything, like, detroit wise or detroit hardcore wise that you're like people think it's this way but like if they were here even for a show they would realize it's it's not um i mean a lot of people think detroit and they think crime and you know just a bad areas which don't get me wrong you know there are very bad areas and it's just it's just like any other city though uh mm -hmm. you just gotta kind of there's bad areas everywhere you know you could walk down the street and there'll be a perfectly fine area and turn the corner and it's some, somewhere you really need to watch out for i think a lot of right. people are kind of intimidated about their gear getting stolen and all that which it does happen but it's it's not really all that bad i would say the, the number one thing about detroit that people say like oh you know i was kind of kind of worried coming down here that i'd i'd run into some shit but um no, I mean, I've never I've been going to shows down here since I was 14. Just kind of like anywhere else, just kind of look, look after yourself. And that 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 would, would be the only common misconception about Detroit. I mean, I think a lot of people, especially lately, have been, this is like a, a good stop for them. Mm. So, and I yeah. think because we're a little bit north, a lot of people tend to, it doesn't really fit in their routing a whole lot. But, um, yeah, I think it's kind of more of a priority for people to stop by as of lately. Yeah. yeah. And I think any of, like, the gear stealing kind of shit, like, I almost think, I would almost argue that, like, the the likelihood of that happening is probably higher in, like, the places that have just more dense populations, like sure, LA yeah. or New York or Toronto up here in Canada. Like, I, like, you know, there's bad apples anywhere you go. I've seen bands have that unfortunately happen in multiple areas all around the country and, you know, D Detroit included, but I don't think that is like the outlier of like, Oh, well, like it's known for this. Like the only time that I've gone through Detroit was like, I was driving. Um, I was helping my parents move from Winnipeg where I'm from all the way to to toronto where they're at now and i think we drove through detroit and i think maybe just based off like trying to get off like um i i i couldn't even tell you what road it was but i was like there was like certain parts i was like oh like we are in detroit and uh, <laughs> but at the same time it's like you know 
when any when whenever something's on paper like winnipeg where i grew up is like the murder capital of canada and there are like certain oh, really? places and parts of that city that certain people are like um there's no way you would catch me like walking there when it's like when the sun is set because of whatever but it's like i have friends that own houses there and families and they're like yeah it's fine like you know so everything is like you know everyone's conditioned to whatever they grew up with as far as like you know their safety or anything like that right um yeah absolutely yeah yeah like even like i've moved now but like the place i i lived um uh uh just a couple months ago uh in calgary was on the outskirts of 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 the city and people like thought it was the hood and i was like i saw more crime living five minutes away from downtown where people are like looking in cars and fucking like stealing shit and busting shit open because like if anything it's like the city center is where you know a lot of people who are struggling with homelessness or or whatever um that's that's going down versus like the outskirts of the city you know like where it's the burbs so yeah it's it's very interesting on on the takes people have but i think with the 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 positive things through like the shows and the videos like you know any stigma is is clearly being squashed very quickly it seems yeah absolutely and i i agree with what you say as far as just kind of having the perspective on the area itself it's just kind of you know when people get a clearer perspective in Detroit, they see it in a different light, I guess yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you know, I think the same thing applies even outside of like, like crime or anything. It's like, Oh, like Missouri, like who plays shows there? But right. it's like, again, you see the videos and you see that it's like, Oh, now you can't even deny it. Um, and that's the huge reason why I started to scope is like, well, the only way that we're going to start a, a shift in bands uh, and tours being skipped in Western Canada, because it is like when you're just looking on paper, it's like, Oh, these cities are like a long ass drive to, to get from, from place to place. But like, I know that there are bands and promoters and, and people that are active in this shit. And so it's like, I just need to put a spotlight on it and I need to, you know, take those videos, do the, do those podcasts, like shout those people out and I think in time over the last almost six years that I've been running this shit, it's, you know, there's shifts that are happening and, you know, I'm sure it's the same for, for bands and promoters and all people from all around the world when, you know, it's, it's a grind, but like over the years you start to see that. And I feel like there's almost like an acceleration because of this uh, new wave of, of hardcore and how people are discovering that up front online first versus uh you know if they went to school and saw someone with a a marauder shirt on or something like that right yeah no definitely um what is bubba 333 oh bubba's 33 the uh (laughs) yes great the greatest bar food known to man let me tell you what uh okay (laughs) no it's uh it's a spot that you know enemy of god or big deal or uh all of our friends all hang out at and uh i just they they have a a habanero burger that i just fell in love with i got it uh i got the the logo tattooed on me and uh (laughs) is their uh, logo a a a a misfire gun is that their logo no i don't think so Oh, because when I saw it, it was, uh, I thought that was the tattoo that you have. It's like a gun and it's got a oh. flag that says Bubba 333. Yeah, no. So actually, um, my brother, my uh, other brother, my younger brother was a tattoo artist at the time. And uh, he showed me his flash shoot and uh, he had one of those, you know, the bang guns, the misfired guns. Right. And I'm like, do that, but put Bubba 33 in it. So the tattoo <laughs> I have, I guess it's... It's not of the logo, but it, I don't know. It's just something. It's stupid, but uh, they uh, they saw some videos of me saying like shouting them out on stage, and uh, <laughs> I went in. There, I went in there. They gave me free food. They gave me like a whole bunch of shirts. They're like, just wear this. Are you live serious? We'll hook, we'll hook you up. So I don't know. It's <laughs> it's funny. It's just kind of like a little little inside joke, but I mean, they take well, care. Well, dude, of me. <laughs> you've probably brought them some business, so they want to scratch your back. 
we're t- yeah, like yeah. we're giving them free press on this podcast that goes out to hundreds of people from all over the world so yeah you know sh- sh- shout out to the sponsor bubba's 33 you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, it's yeah. uh that's very cool um is is the habit narrow sandwich you're still your go-to or are you like are you someone when oh, you go to a food spot and you find the thing are you like i want to continue to per- peruse the menu or i only order this thing i just get fixated on one item i think i've mm-hmm. i think i've strayed away from the habanero burger once and it was just a mistake because i was like I Immediate just the habanero. <laughs> this is what the, for the listeners you got to get strawberry daiquiri uh i get it no alcohol of course um right. and then loaded fries and then the habanero burger with cajun fries you're set whoa two sets of fries i crush it every time every time <laughs> okay so what's the loaded fries compared to cajun i'm sure it's just cajun spice but what's the loaded? right uh you got like bacon cheese it comes with i think some jalapenos on it so those are usually that's, that's those are usually a, for the table that true but that's like an ingredient or two away from being straight up poutine so I mean, I wish it was poutine. <laughs> but, <laughs> can't can't find really um, good authentic poutine around here. That's true. Yeah, that's there's. I'm I'm having a realization as we're talking about poutine or poutine. Um, but I'm gonna be in Montreal for uh Montreal Madhouse Fest. And I thought about bringing it up when you mentioned um the the ten local bands for ten dollars show because that fest yeah. is all local and regional oh, like quebec so bands cool. so i'm like very excited to be like i only know one band on this bill but i'm excited to like see all these bands if anything i'm excited to kind of be humbled to like having bands sing in english and then speak in between songs in french if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're yeah. like i have no idea what you're saying bro but um you know kind of being that that outsider but um i realizing that i can eat proper montreal poutine um in a couple of weeks here so i'm fucking jacked i'm oh, salivating it's right now thinking about it yeah i went to i went to montreal and quebec city once that was our first short leash tour ever and uh mm. I, I still talk about montreal and how crazy of a city it was like just sitting out there saturday night like I think I just people watched for like three hours because everyone was just partying. <laughs> there's there's people picking up like ambulances picking up people that were like passed out, and then people were jumping on the ambulances like taking selfies. It was like oh my the god, the most wild thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I sat by a trash can for three hours straight, just kind of hanging out, you know, mm-hmm. eating some poutine. Yeah. And... <laughs> Dude. I, I will definitely uh, snap a photo when I get my my poutine and uh, and send it your way. Not to cause some FOMO oh. or anything, but just you know, just connecting <laughs> the dots from what we're talking about here. Yeah, there will be some FOMO. That's for sure. I can right I can tell you that. <laughs> right. What's like the Detroit food like thing that y'all are known for? Am I am I just having a, a brain fart as to what that would be, or is there something specific? Um, Detroit style pizza for sure. Oh, true. Like thinner crust. You know, you got the pepperoni on the bottom. Like Buddy's Pizza is a big one. Um, mm, right. Yeah, I'd say that's like the main. Either that or Coney Dogs are pretty big. I know it's not like a, a Detroit special. Oh, you don't okay. know what Coney Dogs are? No. What's so that? You have a Detroit, you have a Detroit Coney, which is like a, a hot dog with chili on it, with like beans and stuff. And then you have wait, a wait, Flint wait, 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 Coney, wait. Uh, a cone like Coney with a K or a C, because I'm thinking C. Coney 2012. Okay, okay. So <laughs> oh, no, no, not Coney 2012. C O N E Y. So yeah, okay. you have like your hot dogs with like beans, like a bean based chili, and then you have your Flint dogs, which are like a beef based chili. So, oh. and then in downtown Detroit, you have National Coney and Lafayette Coney, like connected to each other and they're two competitors. So I'd say Coney dogs are another like huge, huge Detroit staple around here. Yeah. I, uh, that's the first time I ever hearing about Coney. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm searching 
coney dogs because um, i need to see what this shit looks like <laughs> it's it's like uh it's not like a <laughs> groundbreaking food but it's uh <laughs> definitely definitely hits the spot sometimes man i gotta yeah. well, next time you're in detroit we'll have to we'll have to go out for some conies it'll, and, uh, it'll be the the tour of uh bubba's and then coney dogs <laughs> and then just Detro- Detro- black Detro- style coffee. pizza and then we'll just be shitting our guts out at the end of the, all that it's uh more than likely what would happen <laughs> <laughs> um What's the last time you shit your guts out? <laughs> oh God, last time I shit my guts out, it, it couldn't have been that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm um, being honest. <laughs> I mean, for me, Taco it's Bell, like a, a at least a once a week thing because I have like a irritable irritable bowel sy- syndrome. But um, oh okay, but yeah, sometimes yeah, like uh, there's always like the average like this is how. It, how many times you should be shitting a day and then i'm like times that by two brother because that's me (laughs) let me tell you what subway like my every time i eat subway i'm just like all right this is about to be a bad day like it's good going down but yeah dude i don't know what it is i think it's a lot of people say it's those onions like the onions just upset your stomach like the raw onions i don't don't know man but that's like one food i Every time I eat it, I say I will never eat it again, but it's it's so good. But yeah, that's that's probably the last time I've uh you know, had had some issues. <laughs> yeah. If I ever see you at Subway, I'm just taking this portion of the podcast and clipping it to you and be like, Joe, you're better <laughs> yeah. than that. You're caught, yeah. Don't be around yeah, me you're for caught. Like four hours. <laughs> Or um, okay, the the one time that was really bad was we were in Nashville and I tried a five pound burrito challenge. Oh, I was just like that does sound. We were in Nashville. It was a uh, Gatlinburg, mm. and uh, man, that was that was awful. That was awful. That's probably the worst <laughs> I've ever felt from eating food. I didn't actually even complete the challenge. I'd say I got about three and a half pounds in, and um, mm. I just started vomiting. <laughs> I seeing like the eating challenges where it's like, if you eat this, it's free. And like, there's people that are like do that as like their living. Cause that's like their thing. I'm like, you're just soaking this in water and sliding. Like there's no, I know and have been called out by my wife time and time again, that it's like, you need to chew your food and you need to enjoy your food. Sometimes I'm so like just guzzling something down, but that is at a yep. new level of like, there's no enjoyment there. I'm eating fast because I'm enjoying what I'm eating, but I feel like that's at, at a new extreme. No, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like the quantity. I like spicy food, so I like to eat the the hottest thing. Which actually, right. Wing Porium, Wing Porium in Toronto, they have the black mamba, and uh, I did, I completed that challenge. I did it. That was oh, that was rough. You but... you do you know this is a not an isolated <laughs> thing. You do some food challenges. It's just tempting, man. Whenever you see a challenge, it's like, and I, they, usually they have like a wall of flame they put your picture on, and uh, right. they took it down. Right. And they took it down to put a TV up there. So I was like, I'm trying to get on the wall of flame. And they're like, oh, right. that doesn't exist anymore. They're like, we, we have a website that no one looks at. I'm like, so is there any like reward or anything for this? And they're just like, nope. I'm like, I'll just prove to myself I can do it. <laughs> so I, ended up doing it. <laughs> I just want to do it so I can talk about it on the podcast later. But yeah. I knew it'd come in handy um, one day. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, how many food challenges have you done in your on, on your time on this earth? Oh God, there was that one. Are you double digits? Bur- no, probably not double digits. Okay. Uh, there was one. It was actually a guy who streamed RuneScape, um, and he was. You ever played RuneScape? It's like a World of, of Warcraft. I've obviously played RuneScape. Oh, okay, okay. But you gave me a look. I, I'm connecting the food eating to uh, yeah. my childhood internet games. <laughs> so he was streaming RuneScape, and he was like, "I will give a hundred. I think it was two hundred twenty-five dollars to anyone that could eat two onions raw <laughs> on the stream. You can't cook it. You can't cut it. You have to eat it like an apple. And I'm just like, uh, I'll do three. 
I told him that. I was like, I'll, <laughs> oh I'll do three. God. He's like, he's like, I think you're underestimating how hard this is. He's like, do two. So next thing you know, I'm on a stream live eating raw onions. And uh, <laughs> I got, I got about, or no, sorry, it was three onions. I said I'd do four. Um, I got about two and a half in and just full projectile on a stream in front of hundreds of people just puked everywhere. Oh, it's, my uh, God. Yeah. It, Where but the is thing this is, clip? <laughs> oh, my God. I wish I – it was it was live, so I don't even know you. Oh, it. yeah. And he, he told me, he's like, you know what, dude? He's like, you gave it your all. I'm going to give you $100 plus you get uh, whatever people donated. So I ended up getting like 175 bucks, Dude. And uh, – uh, I didn't want to eat. You're bringing me to like the tears. Next, like, five <laughs> <laughs> I woke up this morning and all I thought I was gonna watch uh, someone live stream RuneScape, and then I ended up projectile vomiting just <laughs> onions in front of hundreds of people. Oh my god! Yep. Good times, man. Good times. Good times. I'd say those. Was... <laughs> I'd say that was probably about the the extent of my food challenge career, but I hey, I'm open to anything. I I'm <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's funny uh when Lumpy was on the podcast uh super recently we talked about how more fests and more venues should have like a coffee station or like something on on uh oh, on tap, whether it's cold brew. But now off of our conversations like I feel like some fest should have a food a food eating competition for bands. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Could you imagine That'd... an intermission break in between bands and it's all these dudes and, <laughs> and gals or whoever who wants to just eat obscene amounts of food? Yeah, I would be as a captivated table. as a band who's killing a set. Yeah, I I don't care who's playing. I'm there. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if you're listening to this and you're also a food challenge uh connoisseur um let me know because if there's if there's a case to be made for this i i want to know who's who's game to do that yeah i want to say on air uh we'll go toe to toe i'll, uh, I'll <laughs> mouth to mouth I'll destroy it no homo, eating. but <laughs> yeah <laughs> dude that's so funny ah what man you, you you brought up runescape and that's bringing a whole new wave of nostalgia for me I feel like kids today will never know the beauty of being able to do that shit. After so did game. All, yes. So I got laid off during the pandemic for like four weeks, I think it was. And um, I don't think I did anything else. I got back into <laughs> the, to the old school RuneScape. And uh, I remember my friend Brian Rogers coming down in my basement. He's like, you got a problem. Like <laughs> you got to see some sunlight. <laughs> I got hooked again, just based off of nostalgia. I was just like, wow. Right. This brings back it, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy that their servers are still running because a lot of like early games for me that were more so on like consoles. So like, you know, Halo uh, two and Halo three, like, or they would just discontinue. They would just like stop those servers over time. Um, probably because it was just too expensive to keep running it because of like the, the player count. But like the fact that it was an option for years for people to still go and play those games, you know, and then it's like, well, like, what am I going to do now? But the fact that RuneScape is still going and it's a free to play game. It's not something that yeah. you have to like get a fucking $10 a month membership or anything like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's very, very cool. Yeah, and there are like member worlds, like as you probably know, where you can sure. pay yeah, yeah. Uh, five, ten dollars a month. But actually, now when they rebooted the 07 RuneScape, you could actually use like in game coin to buy your membership. Oh, interesting. It's like, I, I think it's three mil for like a month, but still, I mean, <laughs> you, you, got, you grind out on some uh, mining, you're set. <laughs> oh, yeah, straight up. Um, yeah. I think that thanks to that game, that was my first early introduction to like rage quitting because nothing was worse <laughs> as like a 12 to 13 year old and playing that game and having my entire the entirety of my life. And then somehow I'm dumb enough to walk across the border of the wild and then I would get fucking like 
huge magic combo from across the map and then i'm like i've lost everything and i would fucking slam my like i had no laptop at the time i think i just like like hit my desk and then just like turned my computer off and then it was like yep. you know didn't play it for a week and then i was right back to it oh yeah there's been tears and bloodshed by me for that <laughs> game very much so um well Joe, um, as far as like, you know, we, we've talked lots of big deal stuff, but like, obviously you also play guitar and enemy of God and hushed, um, anything, you know, before we start to wrap up as far as like things that are going on in, uh, in all the, the different bands that you're part of that you're looking forward to excited about things that you can talk about. Cause I'm sure there's always things that you probably got to keep hush hush for, for now, pun, pun unintended there. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, just honestly, every band I'm in is kind of in the writing stage. I'd say besides Big Deal, we're kind of finishing up the record. Enemy of God's working on doing like a two song release soon here. Um, Hush, I don't know. That's kind of just a more here and there project, uh, just kind of for fun. Um, but we have some new material we're working on. Eventually, we'll get that out. Um, Enemy of God's going to try to push those two songs out probably this year for sure. Okay. Um, hopefully, cool. hopefully by like summer, maybe maybe a little bit later, like August, September, I would say. Um, cool. And then other than that, just playing playing shows and trying to have fun with it, you know. For sure, yeah. I I, I love to see it, and I hope there's big things uh, in the future for all those bands. But uh, you know, big deal specifically because seeing you know you your stage presence and how you carry yourself as a front man is like is very it's very dope and i think you have it down pat and i think people are recognizing that so um joe as you know the very last question i ask anyone on the show is a favorite mosh story that they would like to share and that's anything that's first your head that could be funny uh gruesome violent wholesome whatever is first year dome is how we start to wrap the show um i'd say the one comes to mind is bitter truth was playing in grand rapids their hometown at the time and they played product of waste fuck up and naturally that's like one of my that's a song i've wanted to cover for a while so i go off and I split my head open and um, break my wrist at the same time. Um, just okay. <laughs> stage diving or what have you. I, you know, well, um, I, we end up, they're like, do we need to take you to the hospital? I'm like, no, I want hot wings. You know, so we went to, <laughs> we went to get some wings and I'm bleeding out my head, like down my shoulder. And I remember the manager coming out and she's like, uh, do you need us to call an ambulance? Like, you don't really look right. And, you know, I'm like half out of it. And I like jokingly like start cracking pepper in my head. <laughs> it's like, I'm trying everything. Yet. It's not working. So, uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was my biggest mosh injury story. Um, You should go to the There's hospital. There's a lot. I want hot wings. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. really should go to the hospital if you're thinking that. Yep, I ended up, uh, my head, got it stitched up. And then they're like, do you want us to check out your wrist? I'm like, no, I'm more concerned about my head that's gashed open. Mm-hmm. My wrist, I actually ended up breaking my, um, I ended up breaking my wrist, uh, a bone, small bone called the scaphoid bone. And um, Okay. I ended up getting it checked out again, like eight months later when I tweaked it again and ended up having to get like bone graft surgery and uh, it was just a whole nine, like oh, terrible. God. So I wasn't, I was in a cast for a long, long time and I wasn't able to play was a lot that, of enemies. Was that there. the reason you were in a, in a cast at Hold Your Ground? Yeah. Yep. Oh, I see. That was because of the Which did injury. not um, prevent you from, from, Hitting <laughs> hard as fuck as well, I will say. Dude, hold your ground. That was that was a solid time. That was another fest that was just like, oh, I hope I hope it's like that every year. I I plan on being a regular attendee because that was yes, that was a fun time, man. Yeah, 
I would argue and hope that Big Deal gets to play that one year because, you know, I think y'all would do well. Give you some opportunities to maybe not fucking split your head open and then crave wings <laughs> immediately. So, <laughs> no, yeah, I'd, I'd love that if we were able to play. That would be insane. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And you well, guys played, um, you guys played Hold Your Ground, didn't you? Was it day one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we played day one. Yeah, see, we were only able to go for the the second day, but yeah, I'm hoping to catch. Who knows? Endgame. Maybe maybe yeah. there's a, a possibility that one year it will be Big Deal and Endgame playing together. Um, I'd be very into that myself. Let's do it. If you guys ever Let's need to come it. to Detroit, you got a show, you got a place to stay. Oh, you know, else. you know, you you're one of the first people to hit up there. So, um, <laughs> Joe. This has been a really, really fun chat. Um, we've hit on things that I f- would have never anticipated that we would hit on <laughs> as far as like RuneScape and uh, just different things. But, you know, I think that's the beauty of this pod because, you know, sometimes, you know, we can just shoot the shit at a show that we're both at, but we don't get to get get into the nitty gritty where we can just like see where, you know, the flow takes us. Um, all your band links, all of your links will be in the description and in the show notes. Anything you want to shout out, anything you want to plug, or anything you want to send the people off with before we go? Uh, shout out Edgeman, shout out uh, Sanctuary, D Block, Doubt It, uh, Detroit Hardcore, uh, the DHC Zine, the, the network and podcast that's coming out. Um, they've been doing crazy things. Collide Records. Yeah. Just keep putting on for your city, whether it be a big, Big city, small city, whatever it be, it, it matters, you know. Absolutely. It's very, very easy just to see the 2,000 people uh, shows or, you know, the, the cool fests uh, in the big hubs of hardcore. But, you know, you're, you exist in your hardcore scene for a reason, and you could be the change to really, you know, make it as dope as, as you want it to be. And all it Absolutely. takes is a little bit of time. A little bit of hard work, a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, and you know that change will come. And Joe's an example of that, and that's a reason that you know you're here. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to to chat with me, bro. This has been really fun. Oh, thank you for having me. I was excited when you asked me. So, thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Jordan. Support Scope Exposure. So hell yeah, yeah.